Knowledge in depth will still be the possession of experts, of academic scholars, people who really go in in some detail into, into, into a subject. Information, on the other hand, will be accessible to anybody with access to a phone and internet. When you are born as a human being, you carry the debt of being a human by expressing yourself through empathy. But it's also um, harvesting the knowledge that those platforms are able to create in this new digital world, and particularly the social media. We bring this program, GLF Toronto, to you with the idea that collectively we can make a difference. That artists and writers and thinkers and speakers, they consider, they look into the past, they consider the present and they envision a better future for each and every one of us. Welcome to the second session of the day. On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, Shrinka Walia, and my colleagues at Team Arts and JLF Toronto, we welcome you to this session of JLF Toronto Virtual Festival. Home Precious Home, Najwa Zebian and Shashi Bhatt in conversation with Aparita Bhandari. Our podcast partner for this session is Lon Shura. A session on speaking up, a session on silence. Lebanese-Canadian activist, poet, and writer Najwa Zebian's book, Welcome Home, explores a revolutionary concept of home, your safe place. Weaving together memoir, poetry, and storytelling, the narrative follows her journey of alienation from Lebanon to Canada and her experience of creating an independent identity for herself, devoid of cultural expectations. Writer Shashi Bhatt's novel, The Most Precious Substance on Earth, follows the life of an Indian-Canadian girl from her teens to adulthood and a striking take on how silence can shape a life. A sharp commentary on the harsh realities girls and women face on a daily basis, the tale follows the protagonist's struggles at finding a voice under the shadow of trauma. In conversation with Aparita Bandari, Najwa and uh, Shashi undertake a quest of belonging, self-worth, and finding hope. Introducing our speakers for the session, Najwa Zebin is a Lebanese-Canadian activist, author, speaker, and educator. Her best-selling books of poetry including Mind Platter, The Nectar of Pain, and Sparks of Phoenix. After self-publishing her first collection of poetry and prose, she went on to become a teacher and doctoral candidate in educational leadership and she recently launched the digital school Soul Academy and the podcast Stories of the Soul. Shashi Bhatt is the author of the novels The Family Took Shape, a finalist for the Thomas Reddle Atlantic Fiction Award, and most recently, The Most Precious Substance on, uh, on Earth. Her fiction has won the Writer's Trust Prize and has been shortlisted for a National Magazine Award and the RBC Brownwin Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. Shashi is currently Editor-in-Chief of Event Magazine and teaches creative writing at Douglas College in conversation with Aparita Bhandari. Aparita is an arts and life reporter in Toronto. Her areas of interest and expertise lie, lies in the intersection of gender, culture, and ethnicity. Her work has appeared in a range of Canadian and international media, including the CBC, The Globe and Mail, a Hazlitt magazine, and Roads and Kingdoms. She's also the producer of Hindi language podcast, khabardarpodcast.com and darmian.com. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A. So please feel free to send in your questions by typing onto the question box on the left-hand side of your screen. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, Home Precious Home, Najwa Zebian and Shashi Bhatt in conversation with Aparita Bhandari. Aparita, over to you. Thanks, Suraj. Welcome, Shashi. Welcome, Zebian. How are you both? Great. How are you? 
I'm well, thanks. I don't know where how things are, where you at, but in Toronto, it's a beautiful sunny day. I wish we were meeting in person, but you know, such is the life in a pandemic. Where where are you, and and how are you? I'm, I'm in New England. I'm oh, sorry. Let's let me start. Sorry, with, uh, <laughs> Shashi. I know this is the thing, right? I should I should, I should be a better moderator. Shashi, let's start with you. Uh, I'm in New Westminster, BC, which is just outside of Vancouver, and it's pretty early in the morning here. It's uh, just after 8 a.m. <laughs> so you're having this conversation after a cup of tea, I hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Najwa, where are you? I'm in London, Ontario, Canada, which is yeah, very close to Toronto, but it's 11 a.m., so I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a beautiful day outside like after after a couple of iffy days it's 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 really quite lovely um which sort of uh, you know we'll 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 come to in this whole conversation about home uh that we're going to have so uh we're we're introducing both of you because of your most recent books Zabian's uh Welcome Home and Shashi's The Most Precious substance on earth. Uh, so, Zabian, may I first, uh, sorry, Najwa, may I first um, ask you for those who would not, might not have read your book yet, uh, could mm -hmm. you just very briefly explain what it is all about? Yeah. So, Welcome Home is a guide to building a home within yourself. And it's, it stands on the realization I made a few years ago while I was giving a TED talk in London, UK, that the biggest mistake that we make is that we build our homes and other people and we invest all the love and care and kindness and everything good that we have within in those homes because at the end of the day, that's what we're coming to. And so when those people walk away, those homes walk away with them and all of a sudden we feel that emptiness on the inside and it's real because we've invested ourselves in a place outside of us. So that doesn't mean that, you know, that place is always going to be outside of us. It means that if we were able to once give so much love and so much kindness and so much everything good, then that means we are the source of it and we can recreate it. But instead of investing it outside of us, we can build that home within so that we are the first place that we go to to feel home. Hmm. That's a fascinating concept of home. I think that's, Thank that's you. not the first thing that, you know, people think of when, when we talk about home. So this is really an interesting um, uh, thought process. And you mentioned that you were um, at a TED Talk uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, this came to you. Could I ask, like, how, how did you start thinking about these ideas of, of home and home <laughs> within and home outside? Yeah, so I remember from a very young age feeling like something was missing constantly. I remember feeling this ache to feel loved and cared for, to feel like I was important to someone, to feel like I was emotionally embraced by someone. And, you know, in my family, my parents are a lot older than me. My siblings are a lot older than me. So I was basically a child, but extremely mature. Like I never experienced you know, things that other kids my age experienced in terms of just being silly and playful and all of that. I was always, you know, following the footsteps of those who were older than me. But that emotional peace that I would feel every time I would see, you know, friends of mine feeling like, you know, they would have like, you know, family events and whatever. And I never had that. So as a child, you don't know how to talk about it the way that I'm talking about it now you just think something must be wrong with me to constantly feel like I'm starving for something so I you know in welcome home I talk about it as it was that like I wanted that that was the only thing I could refer to when I would see you know my friends feeling loved or getting gifts and it wasn't about the gifts it was more about like someone thought of them and I would just name it that, you know, and so the more I, you know, became older and mature, the more I realized that what I had been doing my whole life is searching for that in other people. And so what that meant was that I was always working so hard to prove to others that I deserved that I deserve to be loved by them. I deserve to be welcomed by them. I deserve to be respected by them chosen by them you know prioritized by them and it was always I was expending myself in such a way that 
I would look at the person and think to myself, what would they love? And I would change myself into that person so that I could get that love. And then it just hit me that they're not loving me. I am changing myself to be a version that doesn't maybe it resembles me but that's not fully me I never fully felt that love because I never received it just for being who I am I never received it without people pleasing without abandoning myself so the journey I had always taken was to feel home I had to abandon myself which didn't make sense so once I realized that I was doing that and the emptiness I would feel on the inside when someone would walk away. And any, it didn't have to just be like relationships uh, and romantic relationships. It was with family. It was with friends. It was with work. Once I realized that, I thought to myself, there has to be another answer. Like you can't continue living your life in a way where you base your worthiness on whether someone sees you as worthy like there has to be another way and so it was very uncomfortable for me to start seeing myself as the first place to go to for love and for validation and for you know giving myself basically what I ached for from others it was very hard for me to do that because I never knew how to do that I had to teach myself and so I wrote about all the processes and welcome home. And I also, not only did I have to teach myself, I had to go through the pains of other people looking at me and thinking, oh, you've changed. You're not the same person you were anymore. And that's very uncomfortable, especially for somebody who is extremely sensitive to how people feel. And, you know, I'd always want to make sure everybody was okay and happy. And so in moments where I would feel like someone pulled their affection away or their love or respect or attention or whatever it was because I was embracing myself and giving myself what I needed and setting the right boundaries, I had to experience that pain and sit with it and tell myself, this could easily turn into me reverting back to my old ways or it could be a realization for me that if a person abandons me because I've chosen to be myself and to do what's right for myself, then that person does not truly love me. And so it, it wasn't an easy process. And for everyone listening, this is not like, I know you, you hear, you know, let's build a home within. And it's such a beautiful idea, but it's also, it takes work and it's not easy. And it's all about stopping yourself in the moment where you're aware that you are experiencing a certain kind of emotion or a thought is crossing your mind or a belief of yours from the past. Like I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of money. I'm not worthy of whatever it is. It, and catching that and saying, oh, I see what my brain is trying to tell me. I see what my heart is trying to tell me. I see what my emotions and thoughts are trying to tell me. I could see that, but I could choose not to believe that. And I could choose not to act upon that. And I could choose for myself what I'm going to do and not be so driven by my thoughts and emotions. But instead, I am the one who drives what happens as a result of them. Mm -hmm. I always mm -hmm. talk for more than I should talk, but it's just because <laughs> the ideas flow so quickly that uh, I 100% I yeah. get it. But it's great because I think in many ways, um, these are emotions or thought processes that, you know, the central protagonist of Shashi's book uh, might mm -hmm. be also wrestling with at certain points. So Shashi, your book, The Most Precious Substance on Earth, for those of, uh, you know, the audience who might not have read it, if you could just uh, give us a, a brief uh, description. Sure. Um, so it's a book of fiction, and it's a story about a girl named Nina. When the book starts, she's 14, she's bright, I think she's funny, she's deeply sensitive, and early on in the book, something traumatic happens to her at her high school. Uh, the book follows her through uh, episodes or stories of her life as she grows up and becomes a high school English teacher. Um, it's a kind of coming-of-age story, but 
I don't think a coming of age necessarily means like a triumphant arc of personal growth and self-discovery. Um, if anything, I think this book is the opposite. It's the story of a woman losing herself as a result of both trauma and these like small gender specific indignities. Um, and it also explores the influence that teachers have over the students in their classrooms. So Shashi, uh, what Najwa just said, I think would resonate with a lot of people in terms of, uh, you know, and especially young women, I think, uh, this whole idea of trying to please other people, mm -hmm. to, to sort of live up to other people's expectations of you, and then uh, later on in life kind of wondering, what was that all about? So could you talk a little bit about what Najwa just said and, and how you relate to that or how your character relates to that? Yeah, it's interesting because my character really is a people pleaser, I think. Um, and she is someone who is very like sensitive to other people's reactions and other people's perceptions of her. Um, and I think that was that was what like drew me to writing this character. Um, like I find it I have always found it challenging to speak broadly or abstractly about issues like gender oppression, even though that's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and feeling angry about. Um, and one of the reasons I love fiction is that like, I could write this specific story of one woman's experience, but use that as a vehicle for um, like a broader, more universal exploration of the silencing of women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Shashi, in, in, in your novel, um, you, you sort of mentioned this coming of age um, trope. Um, and there has been recently a lot of interest in what we typically call YA novels. Um, and even in our popular culture, there has been a fair amount of exploration of, of uh, recently, very recently, of young women um, of a certain age. I'm thinking about series like, you know, the Netflix sort of Never Have I Ever, um, in which you have a young woman of color and she's going through high school. Um, are we at a particular point of time where we're uh, sort of exploring? Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of curious about this particular point of time where we're exploring these stories. Why are they so uh, important to tell? Because often they're it's, it's very dismissive. Oh, coming of age, you know, teen stories, mm -hmm. they're, you know, whatever, young people, uh, th th often it's, it's dismissed. Yeah, that's interesting. And I love the show, Never Have I Ever. <laughs> um, and one thing I love about that show is that, like, the main character is South Asian, but that's not her only story like that's not even really the main focus of the story and that's kind of something I was going for in my book as well um, my character is uh, South Asian like she's the daughter of immigrants but her story is, is about other things really it's just a part of her identity um, and I do think like stories of young adults sometimes get dismissed um, part of what like what I was going for when I started writing this was like it is uh, adult literary fiction, but I think it's told in the voice of a like like smart, savvy, funny teenager, and I think that can be kind of disarming. Like a reader might go into it thinking like, "Oh, this is going to be a fun YA tale," but then it turns towards something um, like darker and uncomfortably realistic and true. So I, I saw that YA voice as like an avenue into um, exploring something more real. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that addresses your question. <laughs> no, no, it does. Um, and, and YA, for those of, of, of us who might not know, we we're talking about young adult, I should have mentioned this uh, before introducing the term. Um, so Najwa, uh, you know, uh, Shashi's book, as she said, um, you know, follows this young woman, Nina, and eventually she becomes a teacher herself. And mm -hmm. uh, she's not the paragon of virtue, if you will. Um, uh, with your, you mentioned, you know, when, when you were writing as a, a being fairly self-aware as a young person, but do you, and then, you know, um, observing yourself, it sounds like um, through the years, but do you think you needed to kind of uh, step back or, or have that experience of, of life, of just things around you before you could sort of put these um, ideas of yours to, to paper? I mean, was there, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, at what point did you have that aha moment of, okay, 
this is a story that I really need to tell? So I would say that I spent most of my life just observing people. So I would internalize the way I felt because as a youngster, anytime that I would express emotion, I would get shut down and told either that I was sensitive or that I was not grateful for what I had or, you know, like say I was bullied in school, that was just, you know, just it was overlooked and not really given any kind of attention. So I immediately internalized that my emotions did not matter. So what that meant was that I was just quiet for a lot of the time. So I would just look at other people and I would, again, internalize their, the experiences that they were going through and, you know, make them in a way make me feel something about myself so if I would see someone's emotions being validated I would think well they're just lucky I'm never going to have that because I haven't up to this point and none of my experiences have reflected that so um you know the first time I ever started expressing myself was when I was 13 because a friend of mine while I was still in Lebanon she was my only friend um she gifted me a handmade journal and that was the first time I started writing and not feeling like I was being shut down. So there was no one saying, you're too sensitive. There was no, no one judging me for the way I felt. And then at 16, I moved to Canada and my family was all here at this point. And um, I just came for the summer and then the war broke out in Lebanon, so I couldn't go back. And I had to make the decision, which really at the time didn't feel like a decision. It felt like it, you know, I had to make that decision for my safety and for, you know, it was the year right before university and all of that. So every time I would come to write in my journal, which, you know, it contained my feelings, it contained my hopes for the future. And those hopes were mostly, you know, one day my, my knight in shining armor will come and save me because that's what you're trained to believe as a young girl, especially coming from my culture is, you know, you get to an age where you have to get married, start having kids. And so the more I wrote, the more I felt like I'm in so much pain, like I'm validating the pain. But the painful part about it all was that I was realizing that there was nothing I could do about it. I was helpless. I was in a new country, even though I visited Canada more than once. I still, it wasn't my home country. It was, I couldn't speak, you know, my first language with people on the street. I couldn't even speak with people on the street. And even though I spoke English perfectly, I felt so out of place. So I ripped up that journal and said, I'm never writing again. And I would describe, I've always described it this way, the next six or seven years as I lived them in black and white, I just didn't want to feel anything. I was really sad, but I was also really numb. Like I did not allow myself to go out and experience things, or I just followed the steps that I believed were right. So whether it was about religion or culture or you know, in my education, I followed what my parents believed what was right for me. And then I did science in a university, which I didn't want to do, but I did it because my parents wanted me to be a dentist. So I went into science, hated my life for four years because I wasn't passionate about it. And then I asked myself when I was done, because, you know, now is the time to find a job and there are no jobs with just a science degree. So I, I asked myself, what do I genuinely enjoy? Like, think back to the moments when I felt, you know, really good about myself. And it was when I helped someone in some way. And so I thought education. So I went to teacher's college. I'm getting to the point where I started writing again. So I, well, after I graduated from teacher's college, I was assigned at a private school, eight Libyan refugees who were from grade two to grade eight. And I clearly remember the moment they walked into the school and the principal told me, these are your responsibility for the rest of the year. They just looked at me and I could immediately see my 16 year old self who arrived here, having to go to school thinking, I don't belong here. What am I doing here? Uh, I don't fit in. I can't speak my mind, you know, back home, I was like the top of my class. And what am I doing here? And 
So I saw that look in their faces, that look of being lost, like, and not wanting to be there. And something within me just said, you have to tell these kids, you belong here. You don't have to fight for a place here. You don't have to exert yourself more than anyone else does here. So I started writing short reflections about how education, you know, is for students and about students. It's not about grades. It's not about, it's about serving them as human beings and making them feel welcome. And in a beautiful way, I was helping them heal. And I was helping my 16 year old self that never healed mm -hmm. for the last seven or eight years. I was helping her heal as well. And so once I started writing, that was the beginning and end you know, it was the beginning of my liberation. It was the end of me feeling like I'm not important. My emotions are not important or valid. Like, and, and not only are they not important or valid, they're shameful to have. That was the beginning of the end of me believing all of that. And so Mind Platter was self-published and The Nectar of Pain was self-published. Then I got a publishing deal and all three of my books, both both of Mind Platter and The Nectar of Pain and then Sparks of Phoenix went through that one publisher. And then it was during that time that I gave that TEDx talk and it was about finding home through poetry. And the mm. theme of that event was it's about time. So my you know, tagline was it's about time to feel. And so I made my whole TEDx talk about you know, you have to dip into that pain that you're experiencing and ask yourself, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Like, where, where did I form this identity that I have of somebody who isn't worthy of all good things? Where did, where did that come from? And so that's where those words came out of me. You know, the biggest mistake that we make is that we build our homes and other people. And that was something that just came out on stage. And I, wow. because right before I went on stage, I completely forgot everything I had memorized. And I just told myself, you're telling people to feel and be vulnerable, be vulnerable and just see where the speech takes you. And those words came out and I, I, I went home that no, not home to my hotel room that night. And I started a Word document because I started visualizing what that home within would look like. And I was like, if it were a house, we need to talk about the foundation. So self-acceptance mm -hmm. and self-awareness, that's the foundation. Then there has to be, you know, different rooms. And I imagine self-love, forgiveness, clarity, compassion, right. surrender. And then outside, there's the dream garden about your purpose. So I started imagining if I'm going to tell someone, build a home within what does right. that actually look like? Yeah. Wow. So uh, thank you so much for that, Najwa. I mean, that no is uh, that is uh, quite something that you <laughs> you went and you, this <laughs> thing came out of you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Shashi, my sense is that your novel is perhaps a bit more structured. Um, but in many ways, again, I think that there are so many things that what Najwa, you know, just said uh, kind of relate to Nina or, you know, some of even her peers around her. Um, this kind of idea of, uh, again, young women not being taken seriously or sometimes not taking themselves seriously. So can I ask a little bit about... Um, yeah, just writing this novel, creating these characters, where did they come from? I mean, it's a work of fiction, certainly. Uh, but, you know, were there things that you pulled out of from what you've seen around you? I mean, you're also doing creative writing, uh, teaching it. So I'm just kind of curious. You have a very similar path to Najwa in many ways. Yeah, a lot of what uh, Najwa, what you just said really resonated with me, both in terms of myself and my character. I was pre-med. <laughs> I was supposed to go to med school. So your story about being about to be a dentist <laughs> resonates um and also what you said about um like feeling overlooked or not able to like express emotions that's definitely an experience my character has and um like even though the character's story and her experiences are not mine and they're fiction i was trying to write something that felt emotionally true um and like I wanted to write about a character who um is like she wants to speak up and she often has something to say but she just can't make herself say it um or there are situations when she does speak up and it just doesn't get like, backfires it doesn't go as she intended um or uh 
Yeah, yeah. It was just so many situations like that, and I, I feel like those are experiences that I'm familiar with and was familiar with growing up. Um, I guess the, the thing I thought about a lot when I was writing this was how, when I was a student, I was like such a socially anxious child that if I wanted to speak in class, I like my hands would shake and my heart would palpitate, and I would take so long getting up the nerve to speak that I would like just miss my chance, and other people would talk, and the moment would be over. Um, and that was a feeling I tried to hold on to when I was writing Nina, because I think she's just in the, like a perpetual state of wanting to speak and being unable to. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Najma's case, there was a sense of, uh, you know, um, uh, identity, right? I mean, it's one of those things we kind of, uh, sort of talk about because silencing can come in so many different ways. Um, mm -hmm. and, and finding your voice can come in so many different ways. And Najwa in her book has mentioned this whole idea of, you know, people's assumptions of her. Um, in your case, uh, uh, Shashi, Nina in your book isn't necessarily struggling with her identity as much um, as one would consider, right? Like that whole immigrant question or whatever. But there are other mm. ways in which she's struggling with her identity, other ways in which she's being uh, silenced or finding her voice. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we see her in many different aspects of her life, life, like when she's a student and in school, but then also when she's among friends or later or when she's as a in... Teacher herself. Yeah, like when in her career and then in relationships and in, in all of those aspects of her life, she is struggling to say something. Um, and I'm really interested in that issue of our like idea of silence and how it can become a part of someone's identity. Like Nina is someone who's who's forced into silence because of trauma, but it also becomes a kind of like a coping mechanism for her or a way of protecting herself. Um, I think it allows her to define her own narrative and to like control how she's perceived by others. And like the arc of the book is that like in the beginning, she's forced into silence, but like over time, it becomes a kind of a cloak. And in the end, she's like in this small and cruel way forced to reveal her secret um, and I intended that to feel like a kind of violation, just of a, a different kind than what she has already experienced, because by that point, silence, like it is, or it's a part of her identity. Mm -hmm. uh, just another couple of minutes to audience questions. So we will have that very soon. But I'm just kind of curious about, you know, the forms that both of you chose. Um, and if you could very briefly, because <laughs> we're going to have these audience questions, um, just talk about the, the form. So uh, Shashi, you chose fiction and Najwa, yours is, uh, it, it, it's a blend, right? There's memoir, poetry, there's also some drawings in there, which, is, which are just charming. Um, so could we talk a little bit about form very quickly? Uh, Shashi, you start. Sure. Um, well, I so my book is kind of structured as a novel in stories, and I really love the shape of a short st story. I love how it compresses and highlights the narrative arc while withholding resolution. And I think the ending of a short story often leaves something like, like a feeling like a lump in your throat. Um, I think the ending of a short story can just be devastating. And when you have a series of short stories, it allows for that feeling of discomfort to like build and build and accumulate and then just never really dissipate. And I think that reflects the way my character feels. So that's why I chose that structure. Now, Joy, if we could have it quickly. And yeah. we also have two audience questions. <laughs> so we need to <laughs> So because, you know, my first three books, you, they they spoke about me but not directly you know they spoke about you know it was poetry and prose and so I you know I genuinely believe in the power of storytelling and so I wanted to have my story and welcome home to you know lead through action and say I'm telling you what I went through and I'm telling you what strategies worked for me so that hopefully they can work for you and you can customize them in a way and because I know the power of my words, especially when it's written in poetry and in a poetic form, I also wanted to include that. So the images that you're talking about also, the poetry, the images, they're all meant to make the message stronger and more clear. 
but I genuinely wanted this to be a story or a mix of stories where I'm sharing things from my life and the lives of others to, again, lead through action so that the person reading it can say, you know what, I can see where this is coming from. And I can see this is not just somebody telling me this strategy will work. Trust me. This is somebody saying this worked for me. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Speaking yes. of working for you, Emma has asked, uh, Najwa, you've spoken about how journaling has saved your life. Would you recommend it yes. for others who are feeling lost and out of place? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you write in your journal, it's, it's you speaking to yourself. You are seeing yourself and hearing yourself and validating yourself. You're not waiting for someone to tell you those things. So it's, I believe it's the most powerful thing because you are, again, through action, telling yourself, I am the one who gets to decide, is my feeling in this moment valid? I am the one who gets to decide what I am worthy of. I'm the one who gets to decide whether this pain that I just went through it's painful enough or it's if it's worthy of you know any kind of resolution so i believe journaling is and it's just one of those things where you start mm -hmm. you know i always start with how i'm feeling in the moment and then i end up at a point either in my childhood or a story that i once heard like it takes you on a journey that is so personalized that you wouldn't know you're going to get there without actually just starting and mm -hmm. just it's the flow of the ideas so journaling makes you your own healer and it makes you you know worthy not worthy not that it makes you worthy it makes you believe that you are worthy of being your own home hmm. um shashi perhaps you can take this uh, question from peter in today's world feeling out of place is an emotion experienced by many people out there what advice would you like to give to them Feeling out of place. Oh, it's such a tough one. I don't know if I'm. <laughs> I don't know if I'm like have the authority to give advice to someone because I think I often feel out of place, and I think that's just part of the human experience. Um, like maybe it's helpful to realize that lots of people feel out of place all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is it okay if I add to that? Just if yes, I add not one thing to ahead. that. Yes. So, as someone who felt out of place for almost all of my life I realize now that the reason I felt that way is that I wasn't seeing myself as someone worthy of being in places like I always felt like to fit into that place I needed to change myself in a way to please someone in that place or audience so that I could be part of that but once you stand in your worth there's no such thing of, as feeling out of place. You just, you just recognize this is not the place for me. Let me mm. go find another one. Yeah. Ah. I can see why your words have brought solace to so many people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Shashi, perhaps you can start with this one. Societal circumstances, this is by Ben. Societal circumstances often force people not to be authentic. How would you mm -hmm. suggest people break these shackles? <laughs> are being authentic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, I can only speak about my own experience. I don't know if I can like advise others on how to be authentic. And my way of doing it has been through fiction. Um, like, I feel like I have the freedom to say whatever I want in fiction and say it in the way I want to say it. And I think it's up to every individual to figure out what works for them. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have five more minutes uh, to wrap. So perhaps I can ask this last question by Kiara, and it's, it's a beautiful wrap. Um, both of you could reflect on it. We'll start with you, Shashi, perhaps. Um, how important do you think it is to reconcile with one's past to be able to move ahead in life? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, and I think that's something my character goes through, too. Um, how important is it to reconcile your past to move on? I mean, we have to move on regardless, right? Um, it's just a question of, like, what like, spirit are you moving on in? Um, like, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm not sure. <laughs> 
Najwa, we come to you for the answer. How do you need to reconcile with your past to be able to move on? I would definitely say the key thing is radical acceptance. So it's not about saying, if I accept the past, that means I'm saying that what happened to me was okay, or that what I did was okay. You know, it, radical acceptance means you accept that what happened happened, it was out of your control, or the way you behaved in moments where you knew better, in that moment, that's the best you could do. And there's no way to go back and change it. You just accept that's what happened. And if it, if it, left you with shame or if it left you with guilt or if it left you with any sort of pain any sort of you know something that you know towers over you like a heavy burden that you're carrying then instead of saying i will continue to carry that weight from my past into my present and into my future because that happened in the past and i must do that you say to yourself, let me think, what lessons have I learned from those experiences that could actually make my present more present and more, you know, uh, free of the shackles of all of that, and in turn, make this present create a future that doesn't become a prisoner of my past. So mm. again, you begin with that radical acceptance. Everything that happened in the past, whether it happened to me or it happened by me, I accept that it happened and that I can't do anything to change it right now. I only have power over what I do right now. And if I'm constantly carrying that weight, I'm always going to be dragged back and pulled down. And I don't deserve that. So there's one activity that I have in Welcome Home that's like, the cord cutting activity where anything that has any kind of power over you whether it's a person or your past or whatever you cut that cord and as you're cutting it you're saying i release you i accept you so i'm never going to erase the past i understand that and i understand that there are moments when i think about it where i will feel so much pain and shame and whatever it is but i understand that i cannot change it and I will not judge myself forever because of that I need to recreate reconstruct rebuild move on move forward let go and that way once you've come to that point you not your past and not anyone from your past and not your mm -hmm. past version of yourself you right now are the leader of your life you right now are the most powerful influence in your life Najwa we have like a very quick moment uh, for you to answer this question that Jenna has yes. asked um, yes. she's always found home in other people and every time she's gone through a difficult uh, difficult time because of it welcome home has helped me a lot in valuing myself and my feelings and... <laughs> but I still can't draw boundaries with people how can I start that journey so you have 45 yes. seconds to answer yes. this <laughs> question so <laughs> If you notice in Welcome Home, I talk about building boundaries and, and the last step is to set them. So you have to understand you're not going to go like between day and night from not having boundaries at all to having full on boundaries. You understand you're compassionate with yourself that you as somebody who's an empath who has probably been a people pleaser your whole life little victories. You start by setting a small boundary. I get, you know, this. I'm going to conserve, preserve my time for 45 minutes away from this person. Then you do two hours. Then you do a weekend. Then you do, you take it step by step. And instead of making this radical change that really makes you, put you puts you at risk for, of re, re, sorry, reverting back to your old version or the old version of yourself, you do it bit by bit. You are taking steps. You're not jumping up that staircase. So do it bit by bit. Do something that's a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Then that becomes have to your comfort end zone. It there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this. And Suraj, it's back to you. It sounds like it could have gone forever. Yes. <laughs>
Thank you, Najwa, Shashri, and Aparit. Of course, such a stimulating conversation showing light on the importance of silence and speaking up. More power to each one of you. And Aparit, as you said, thank you. We could have continued with the session forever, but <laughs> was it time? We had to stop. Really sorry for that. But what a fantastic session! Thank you, thank you once again for being part of the virtual edition of JLF Toronto 2021. Thank you. And thank thank you. you. And thank you all for watching and being a great audience. If you like the session, do consider supporting us through the pay what you choose option button on the right hand side of your screen. The support is greatly appreciated. Once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support and special thanks to Launchura for being the podcast partner for this session. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session, Thinking Better: The Art of the Shortcut. Marcus Jusatoy in conversation with Roger Highfield. which is at 1:30 pm eastern time and 11 pm indian standard time now we present john barton from the canlets cape poets and storytellers presenting his poem enjoy chevani's room with an epigraph from james baldwin's novel of the same name i am too various to be trusted Giovanni's room Bookstores took its name in many cities and pubs in others as did side street clubs where men sent drinks to men sought sex found drugs some in dark back rooms since the pitiless shelters it limbs defined the cold off track sanctum scorn found to avoid itself in walls and bulbs naked undraped windows dim as though self-hate waxed to hide the air shaft what we paged our lost way through the squalor his words blew open a door to sunlight and cafes near the sen to the matchless rive droite houseman's thoroughfares claimed as ours outside the law Baldwin cigarette lit drafting from guillotined shame a chrysalis and my second poem school of zeres fino toxic the club where we met run down now run down then the johns sequined with beer dim crush of moon flesh dancing the strobes freeze frame history painting a stock animation mirror balls matches condoms sweat raw limbs shedding shirts shedding disco shrill amyl nitrate doc martens plucked or pierced eyebrows ripped chinos zigzagging tans shyness shunned Sherry your cheeky decanted ploy to haul me home to fortify us both pouring dryly from our clothes after scorching cold flamed our skin run from din making you bold air smokeless one candle lit till you wore me out and down our legs dawn slaked and sprawl sprawled knowledge in depth will still be the possession of experts with academic scholars people who really go in in some detail into 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 a subject 
Information, on the other hand, will be accessible to anybody with access to a phone or internet. When you are born as a human being, you carry the debt of being a human by expressing yourself through empathy. But it's also um, harvesting the knowledge that those platforms are able to create in this new digital world, and particularly the social media. We bring this program, Journal of Toronto, to you with the idea that collectively we can make a difference. That artists and writers and thinkers and speakers, they consider, they look into the past, they consider the present and they envision a better future for each and every one of us.